whatever we were in the here on the podcast yeah. to make the predictions before the quarterfinals but and i mean my prediction was not made before quarterfinals or during quarterfinals i said even before I yeah th- i said exactly during the regular season early in the regular season that monaco will be in the final four yeah i'm not sure if that was uh, one of my predictions before the regular season but definitely like Midway through the season, I, I said it uh, when Milan had their struggles already, and we saw Monaco comfortably in the second or third seed. That this is going to be the year. Of course, they had to overcome a lot of ups and downs. A lot of during the season, during the series, and you know. But, uh, uh, how did your predictions go? Uh, great, uh, except of one. You, I you gave had... I gave one win to Jalgiris. Oh. If I if I hadn't given one winter Jalgiris, that would be a clean sweep for me because four I, correct guesses with I correct said, results i said all in five real madrid in five monaco in five and then i said barcelona in four wow you guys know, you should listen to our podcast just just because of this yeah <laughs> but i mean i don't want to brag about it because you're making these predictions yeah and then you're thinking about possible scenarios how it could um, build up to game five and it's really impossible to say that well partisan will win two games in madrid then there's going to be a big fight <laughs> players will be suspended then madrid will win two games in belgrade and they will close the series uh, at home down 16 at the half so it doesn't really work that way so i don't really want to brag about it one maybe one series i would say uh i feel that i i i had a good pick would be fenerbahce olympiakos because mm. so many people in in lithuanian media i underestimated friends, it to this and they, they were well. saying all in three or all in four yeah and i said this is not your typical eight seat just be aware of of dimitri Satoudis and his team and I, I always felt it's going to be a five game series. So for that, I, I, I'm giving myself some credit. <laughs> mm, yeah. You should definitely do that because uh, yeah. Is this the intro already? Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think we we're just talking you about so? our, uh, uh, it feels so strange without Donatas because it's Urbonus yeah. podcast. And Welcome to Urbonus podcast without Ur- Urbonus. The main guy. The main guy basically. We don't have the, we don't have a, a host today, so we're just going to improvise. Yeah, it's just going to be like some small talk between two two friends who share yeah. the same passion for basketball so we'll see how it goes uh a- anyway uh we had a great week of game fives uh basically we had everything full package for the first time in history we have a team overcoming o2 deficit but we still don't have a team winning game five away from home which proves that basically the home court advantage is kind of a big deal. It might not be a big deal in the first two games of the series, but if the series goes to game five, to the this game is five. where you get the advantage. Yeah, uh, We saw that in Monaco, we saw that um, uh, in Greece, and especially in Madrid. I don't think they could make a comeback like that playing in Stark Arena. So uh, probably we should start from... Real yeah, Madrid I think partisan. so. I think so. And just just going back to your point, the home court advantage. I I loved Bertzakis's uh, quote after, or even I think before the game. Uh, home court advantage in the playoffs means game five home court advantage. Exactly. Just it doesn't it doesn't matter what happens in the first four games because I think before yesterday, uh, even even after y- yesterday's games and yesterday wins for the home teams, you have a negative. Uh, win and loss uh, ratio uh, for the teams that played at mm-hmm. home in in these playoffs. So, and just give me a moment to be myself a little bit. As I said yesterday on Twitter, I want to repeat myself into camera, guys. All fans of those teams that lost Game Five, <laughs> you lost because refs. Yeah, because they were corrupt. They they were <laughs> against your team. They gave all the whistles uh, to the home team. It was unfair, and you were robbed. And now we can move on okay, to, let's to, go. <laughs> to our real podcast. So Real Madrid Partisan, uh, we're going to wrap, wrap up the whole series, but let's talk about Game 5 in, in, in detail. Uh, my take would be that Chacho Rodriguez was playing in 2013, yeah. even though it's 2023. Yeah. And I had the same tweet yesterday it, after the game. It really amazes me to see Rudy Fernandez battling for those balls 
We saw that in Eurobasket. We saw a 37-year-old veteran sacrificing his body for a rebound, for a deflection, for a for a steal, and he did that for Spain. They became European champions. Now it's it's May. It's playoff time in Euroleague, and good old Rudy is doing the same things, diving for every every ball, getting all the 50-50 balls, sacrificing his body. We saw. A dislocated shoulder, shoulder. and M- M- Real Madrid's doctor was trying to fix his arm, and you all also see him playing with that heavy um, uh, elbow elbow wrap. I elbow, don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to call that, that thing, but it's not it, a sleeve because it it's looks so kind of heavy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it it probably gives him a lot of protection, and he's going out there and and he doesn't care about anything else other than getting that ball for his team. So you see that mentality that these veteran players, they can struggle during the regular season. They can have some games off. Uh, they might be on the bench more than they would like to. Um, but you see Chacho running these pick and rolls for 15 minutes. He was the best point guard in the league for 15 minutes in game five. Also Sergio Yul with his off-balance freeze. Uh, that comeback was definitely sparked by these good old vets of, of Real Madrid. I mean... Luka Doncic had the best reaction, I think, uh, posting that old pick of these three guys. Yeah, and uh, I had the same thought immediately after the game in my head. You know, you know, you see on the court Chacho Rudy at the same time, and 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 Yui at the same time, and it feels like 2013, not 2023. Th- Just but nobody said that we are stuck still. Yeah, in, in that period, and and then you have these crazy runs by Madrid, basically. Their, it's their trademark, you know, these crazy runs at home. We have seen this how many times, for how many years, for how many different seasons. And Chacho Rodriguez just delivered one of those quarters of magic where we're used to seeing before in every team he played. Uh, we were missing this in Milano this year, you yeah. know, and, and he just delivered in the biggest game of the season. But just be honest with me. Um, it's halftime. Partizan has a 16-point lead. Yeah. They're feeling very comfortable. Punter is making his shots. They're controlling the game. They're leading the game. A double-digit lead. Did you believe that a comeback was possible at that point of the game? Uh, I finished, uh, you know, watching and commentating the other game, Monaco Maccabi, and it was plus 13 with... Uh, four minutes, I think, in the third quarter. So even after halftime. And my colleague said Partizan is up 13. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but, you know, I don't think it's finished because, you know, it's, it's you, you know Madrid is going to make mm. one more run. I don't know why I believe, I, I, I thought... I thought quite the opposite, actually. You thought it, it's over? I in, thought in, so. In Madrid? Yeah, because they don't have Gershon Yabuselli. They don't have Gabi Dek. Dek. They don't even have Petr Corneli. They're missing bodies. They don't have Vincent Poirier as a backup center. Tavares was in the foul trouble. Mm. Chus Mateo had to depend on a teenager, El Jai. To start. And he had to play his own as a power forward, and which creates some mismatches. He had to trust his own defense once again, which is kind of risky when the other yeah. team is making shots. So I didn't really believe that it's possible. Honestly, I thought that Jelko has this game in, in, in his uh-huh. pocket. I mean, I I I wasn't watching the game live. As I said, we were we were yeah, both, me neither. But we I, I didn't working. spoil myself. Yeah. So after I finished with Monaco Maccabi, and I got back home, I I watched uh, the game on tape delay, mm. but I didn't know the score. Okay. So it kind of felt to me like I'm okay. watching it, uh, sort of live. I knew that Madrid was down. I didn't didn't know the whole situation and and how it happened. So I had to go through it all. And uh, honestly. Going into halftime, I, I didn't think it's, it, it mm. was possible. My probably biggest take of this series, you know, suddenly a lot of people are asking, so wait, wait just Mateo is a good coach because he was probably a bad coach one week ago. And now he's the first and one now in history. He's the first one in history to come back from 0-2. Or yeah. Is Jelko a bad coach suddenly? You know, it's just, you know, I don't think you should judge uh, coaches <laughs> after one series, but... Just Mateo, Chus Mateo actually did one change that I believe, you know, changed the whole series. Obviously, the fight had huge impact, you know. I still believe that that series, if 
if that foul doesn't happen, ends ends in Belgrade. And, you know, I think it had a huge impact. Uh, I was yesterday thinking, you know, Sergio Yu is the MVP of the season, but today I'm like, you know, yeah, you know, it's Kevin Punter who could, you know, just laugh it off and, and go away and, and it, it, it ends there. By the way, it's I, a tricky I, situation. You I, know? I love that moment when Punter hit a free pointer over Tavares off the glass. And he was running back, and it was a tight game. And laughing with... And uh, he was laughing with Sergio Yu. You could see that yeah. these two players are really enjoying, enjoying this Game 5. That was a lovely moment. Uh, it, it, it just shows that what happened in the past, it was emotions, uh, unnecessary foul by Yu, yeah. unnecessary reaction by, by partisan players. And that brawl obviously changed the series. We cannot see it any other way. And what bothers me the most is, I mean... I don't want to talk about it too much, but we, we, uh, we everyone has already the, the talked about it. Suspensions were given, right? And we can talk about Yabusele, what he did in that five games is not enough. When you see like a football player, Luis Suarez, biting somebody in the shoulder and getting a 10 game suspension. Mm. But anyway, whatever. Yabusele is out for the rest of the season. But Matias Lasor got a one game suspension. Gabi Deck got a one game suspension. And Kevin Punter got a two game two suspension. suspension. And that was the game changer. Yeah, because if Punter would get the same uh, treatment, the same one game suspension as the other guys, you could see him in game four and it's probable that Partizan would close it in four with Punter being the best player of the series, in my opinion. Tavares had these monster numbers and performances, but Kevin Punter honestly was the best uh, player of the series. Mm -hmm. What he did in the first part of the series, the game winner, uh, in game one, uh, insane scoring in game two. Even in game five, he was keeping his team in the game. Eight three-pointers. Yeah, so you can only think now that if things didn't go that way, maybe Partizan would be in the final yeah, four right the, now. And, 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 you know, this series will be definitely remembered by, by that brawl, by the impact it had. But one thing I think that changed the series was by just Mateo, the zone defense. Um you know, it didn't work in game two in the second half. You know, it it helped Real to come back, but then they, uh, but then Partizan, you know, knew how to attack and won game two. But in games three and four, it worked perfectly. Partizan had some set plays in game three. Then they were running quite, uh, you know, an interesting uh, setup with just uh, players' movement in game four, and it was pretty bad and yesterday I saw a lot of zone and you know a lot of people were like oh uh so Chus Mateo uh, installed zone and partisan could not beat it so I was like okay let's let me let me go check the stats you know I was I was looking at the game tape today and I wrote it down so in the first half they had uh, six possessions of zone they scored six points partisan so that's like you know one point yeah. per possession so solid then they had uh eight possessions and uh, in another run in an, when when they again went to man to man then we then they went back to zone eight possessions nine points so it's still around uh, one point per possession and in the second half we saw uh real madrid just face guarding kevin punter there was this uh i don't know a period of few possessions where they were like box and one it, it looked similar it wasn't box and one but it was just real madrid not allowing punter to get the ball and they scored six points and another six possessions. So that's like one point per possession against the zone. And I was like, okay, so if they scored one point per possession, what was the problem? And the real problem was partisan def partisan's defense in my eyes. In the second half, Real scored 59 points in a decisive game five. I'm, I was thinking today, how many game sevens in the NBA we have seen where the score is 90 to 85 because of just, you know, the, uh, you are forcing the other team to take the most difficult of shots. And what we saw in the second half was Chacho Rodriguez going right, using his speed, making layups. Partizan helping in these crazy situations where you drive, the, the player doesn't really have huge advantage, but another guy comes in, helps, it's an easy pass, maybe an extra pass and an open three-pointer, you know. Just... Off-ball defense was terrible. One-on-one -on -one defense was... They were overly aggressive, I would say, in the second half. And 
even when they, they did score, you know, against the zone, they got points after five seconds on the other side. So uh, I think the second half was a great image of their whole season. You know, they were they had the number one offense and they had the worst defense or the second worst defense during the whole season. Yeah, they were suffering because of that in the first part of the season. Actually, because of this huge contrast in defense and offense, they weren't really in, in the race for playoffs uh, in the first part of the season. They were, I think, four and nine to start um, after first 13 games, something like that. Yeah, and after the first uh, round of games, we didn't really see them in that picture. We did uh, talk about other teams yeah. potentially making it to the playoffs. Uh, then when everybody was back, they had a full roster, they had uh, their rotation of eight or nine best players, things got better, and they made a huge run in the end of the regular season. And they do deserve a lot of respect for this series. Definitely. Uh, they were one win away. Some could say they were like one shot away. Uh, both games in Stark Arena were very close. Real Madrid was basically saved by Williams Goss, step back free. Let's not forget that. But from Madrid's side, that's what I loved about them, that um, overcoming adversity, players showed up. And I'm not just talking about Eddie Tavares and his numbers or, or Chacho or Rodriguez doing what he did yesterday. Yeah. I'm also talking about Williams Gas. I'm talking about Mario Hezonia in Game 5, playing a huge role defensively and offensively. Um, Adam Hanga had some good stretches in, in this series. Jana Musa was struggling. He's a young player. It's his first EuroLeague playoff experience. He was definitely struggling. But in game five, he also delivered his best performance. 20 points, six so, rebounds, so four assists. Players showed up, and that's that's huge. And that's basically the culture of Real Madrid, what they've created in the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, it's not about tactics. It's more about desire and playing for the badge, as they say. Uh, Hazonia was showing the, the badge after, after the it game was over. I think that Real Madrid's biggest star right now, Vinicius Jr., was enjoying that. Yeah, I think we will see him in more EuroLeague games in the future because how can you not enjoy something like that? Game five players doing these amazing things like, like the veterans or, or even Kevin Punter for Partizan. If I'm a Real Madrid fan. I would applaud Kevin Punter after the game. The, sh the shots he was getting yesterday, oh my god! I mean, they were they were just ridiculous. Some of them. When he is in, in his zone, he's obviously the best scorer right now. We don't have anyone better in, in Euroleague. I'm, and I'm yeah, talking about pure scoring. Yeah. I'm not talking about all the other things like Wade Baldwin mm -hmm. does or Mike James brings uh, to the table. I'm talking about pure, pure scoring. scoring, best pure scorer in Europe right now. Period. I agree. And yesterday we saw star players playing like superstars, you know. Yeah. Mike James had this crazy first half. Uh he had 28 efficiency in the first 10 minutes he was on the court. You want to uh, switch to Monaco Maccabi? Yeah, I think I think we're, we're done with, with we're done with, with Partizan. I, actually just kudos to Partizan fans and Madrid fans. So that fight happened, it was nasty. Uh <laughs> But at the end of the day, it was it was great basketball, and yeah, Monaco Maccabi. Wow, what a first half! What a first half! What a game from Wade Baldwin! What a hustle from from Monaco and just. But also some questions to Maccabi. So you are on the side of Euroleague Mafia, or or what are you trying to no, tell? No, huh? no, no, no. <laughs> My first question is, what happened to Lorenzo Brown? Okay, so I, I got this question yesterday in, in the post game, and uh, I did some research before. He was eight of twenty three and uh, close uh, close to the basket in this series, thirty six percent, thirty seven percent around around the rim. Yeah, and that's you know that was one point of issue I think in this series. We saw that yesterday as well. He was some of the shots he missed. I, I don't know, just unfortunately, you know, he's driving to the basket and missing that layup. Other times he was... Uh, Monaco were ready for him, let's say, forcing the issue, driving into the paint. And and Chima Moneke, who I think was the X-factor yesterday, sure. 
And John Brown did a good job of, of containing him and making him take tough shots just when, when he, yeah. when he go goes inside. And, uh, you know, his three pointers, one day it falls down, the other maybe it doesn't. But and you we don't saw... expect him to be so short when he's wide open. It's, it's kind of a sign of a player that has some confidence issues. But he got a six uh, made freeze from eight in, in game four. Yeah, but I don't think he had, had any confidence I don't think issues. so either, but it's strange to see a player who just led Spain to mm. to uh, European Championship and also has been incredibly uh, consistent for Maccabi whole year, all of a sudden in game five, not being able to make a shot. And I'm... I'm fine with missing shots, but those shots were sh so short. <laughs> it's strange. You can expect something like that from these guys that Maccabi are, are giving shots away, like Alfa Diallo or Yakuba Utara. Yeah. They're not shooters. They're not scorers. Uh, anyway, my issue with, with this whole uh, Brown-Baldwin situation, that Baldwin played um, a great game and Brown had some struggles. Uh, when Maccabi was still in the game, Wade Baldwin made a three-pointer, and Sasha Bradovic took a timeout. After the timeout, Monaco didn't score. Maccabi had a, had a possession. And Lorenzo and then, Brown all of a sudden tried to be the hero. I, I had the same impression. Wade Baldwin didn't get the ball in his hands when they were down five with like a minute and a half to go. It's a crucial possession. Your best player who is hot on fire should be make, the one making all kind of shots yeah, he should be the one in the position to attack but that was lorenzo brown and i i, I think he was blocked by john brown or, or what happened uh, yeah also i mean i love when players try to go for a poster but do you <laughs> that really, was a little bit too do you optimistic. really think <laughs> do you really think you're gonna do that over chima moneke in that situation <laughs> i mean that's crazy anyway i'm, what I'm, I'm not trying to diss lorenzo brown i love him no, no. I love him. He's just one of my favorite players in the league. It just happened that it was not his series, let's say. Wade what, Baldwin what, was wasn't, the best player in the playoffs, according to all the numbers. I wouldn't say it wasn't his series. I think he still played solid enough. It's just unlucky and unfortunate that his worst game uh, came yesterday yeah. in the decisive game five that you lose. And and Wade Baldwin was, Baldwin was I agree, the best player, the best player in these playoffs. And, and what he did yesterday, uh, I love, you know, how Katash just lets him play. He just yeah. emphasizes and, and, and lets him go one-on-one, -on -one, go in transition, you know, some pick and roll, some slip screens for him that Monaco couldn't really handle. And, and basically, you know, you give this freedom to him and you see the results, similarly to what uh, Andrea Trinchieri did with him when he was in Bayern. I just got to say that during the regular season, when teams defend Wade Baldwin, they're giving him the free point shot. They're you, undering him you can, through, yeah. through the screens. They're going under. But you can't do that anymore. When Wade Baldwin hits five from seven, he's unplayable. Uh, I he, think he is just unplayable. Because if you, if you go under and, and you know he shoots the free, now he makes it. You will be punished. And his mid-range... If you're not going under, he gets into the paint every time. His mid-range is, is easy money. I, I don't remember him missing a pull-up jumper. Honestly. There was one <laughs> game in this series where he made missed like three in a row, but after that, he was I, I, not missing anymore. I quickly forget those because after that, he makes like five or six in a row, you know? Uh, 63%. Another, another thing like... Wait, uh, wait, Wade Baldwin, I, I just want yeah. to say that his percentage is out loud. He averaged 19.8 points in the series, 63% on twos, 50% on threes. The only part was his free throw, 64. So, yeah, but but five rebounds per game, 5.8 assists, and uh, 3.2 turnovers. That's Devin Booker's numbers. Six fouls <laughs> uh, drawn per game. Man. Just an amazing performance. We won't have him in the final yeah. four. Well, but we should give some kudos, again, I think, to Monaco as well. I, I, I will get to that part. I, I, I still want to analyze the game a little bit from Maccabi's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, I think they were in a good position at the beginning of the fourth quarter. And Monaco had big problems with their offensive flow in the second half. It was obviously affected by Mike James' uh, injury. He was limping. He, he rolled, I think, he uh, an ankle. 
after what he did in the first half, it looked like he was a different player, but then we saw that he, he could barely move one of his legs. And I mean, uh, you cannot blame him for that. He wanted to play, he wanted to be there on the court, but it was hard for him to score. Obviously, if you if you feel that pain and uh, you can't basically you can't you know push off that leg normally and and if you are Mike James you you lean or you on your explosive yeah, and it's more difficult to drive and to finish to and do attack the rim and Maccabi is sending help from both sides and you have players like Alpha Diallo missing open shots you had even Elio Cobo missing some open shots after let's say Motiunas was doubled and he kicked the ball so M Monaco had big problems with offensive flow and also making shots, but Maccabi couldn't get the rebounds. That's what killed them, uh, the second chance points. 15 offensive Monaco, rebounds Monaco in the fourth quarter, it looked like the only way they can get points is either a dunk or a free throw. <laughs> no way they, they could make a jump shot. It's just either a dunk or a free throw. And even with that big, uh, big issue of, of second chance points, Maccabi was still in a good position until those fouls happened. Until that unsportsmanlike, to be honest, that changed the game. Yeah, really. that one. Five-point possession. It's a, it was a five-point swing, but after that, Jar Jarrell Martin fouled Jordan Lloyd once again and sent him to the line to shoot free free throws. And talking about those calls, to me, it's an unsportsmanlike foul. I think these rules were, were sort of looked at after Zaza Pachulia Kawhi Leonard incident happened. And after that, you see in the NBA and in the EuroLeague, these type of situations called as unsportsmanlike fouls. Although, you can say that Jordan Lloyd stretches his leg a bit further than usual and he's looking for it. But in my opinion, Bonzi Colson has to be smarter. First of all, there's four seconds left on the clock. Jordan Lloyd had a, has a, the ball in his hands. You should be closer to him. Mm. You should be closer to him from the beginning. And after that, of course, Jarrell Martin's second foul to me, it's also a, a clear foul and I don't have a problem with it. But uh, yeah, I mean, you cannot, it's, it's a huge luxury to give away points in the game five away from home, fourth quarter, close game. And that was the momentum uh, switch. After that, Monaco got back their confidence. Elio Cobo felt a little bit better with the ball in his hands. And, and they managed to survive basically with players in foul trouble with Mike James uh, having this injury. Injury. Uh, somehow they survived. And maybe the fact that um, Maccabi was constantly attacking Motiunas with their pick and rolls and that Dante Hall got three quick fouls was actually a blessing in disguise because Sasha Bradovich all of a sudden looked at Chima Moneke exactly. and played this lineup with Chima and John exactly. Brown at five and it worked. Exactly. I, I was, uh, I said, uh, Dante Hall made some of the stupidest fouls yesterday I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. No, no disrespect. But no disrespect. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was just, I think it's a fact, you know, I think his coach yeah. had s s told him the same. Uh, and uh, after that, Chima Moneke and John Brown could play together and uh, they gave great minutes, great energy, offensive rebounds, defense, rim protection. And it was huge for, for Monaco. So his fouls opened the, the door for Chima Moneke actually to play more minutes yesterday. Um, talking about that foul on Jordan Lloyd, we should have gotten him, him uh, instead of Donatas today on the podcast because I don't think he, he tweeted he tweeted that he will wait for this podcast and uh, hear what, what Donatas a, has. Do you has think he's in a condition right now? I don't to think be so. in a podcast. I don't think so. After making it to the <laughs> final four, I don't do you think, think so. that today is the day we should have him on air? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Me neither. You know. <laughs> anyway, he jumps really far away on, on on that shot. I think he jumps way more in front than. Gerald, Gerald Martin does, and and that's why you're talking about that second foul, that, not uh, the unsportsmanlike. Yeah, okay. He, he, that second foul. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. He jumps like one meter in front, and Gerald Martin jumps, I don't know, thirty centimeters maybe in front, and they just happen to, you know, land in the in the same. So you think it's a flop? Uh, it's not a flop. I mean, you know, it's his motion of of a shot. But, uh, and, and, it's, and it's hard to say, obviously the rule book says that you can't land uh, in, in the shooting cylinder, but when the shooting cylinder, cylinder is one meter from the position you are actually jumping from, 
you know, starting from, it's really hard to not do that. So I think it's unlucky for Jarrell Martin. Yeah. Unlucky for Maccabi. I think it's a good call at the same time. So just a tricky situation that got Monaco those huge free throws. I think anyway. we should thank James Harden that players these days <laughs> have the habit of drawing fouls while shooting frees. Yeah. Shout out to James Harden. <laughs> anyway, I think a uh, huge move from Sasha Bradovic to sub out Mike James because it was obvious he could not continue. He wasn't in his he wasn't his himself. I mean, we saw his first half, we saw his second half. That first half performance, I mean. It felt like, you know, he drank the drink before the first half and then they took all his powers away from him because of that ankle injury in the second half. But I was I was saying uh, to my colleague, you know, somebody has to step up, somebody has to step up. And at first, Elia Kobo was, I don't know if you noticed, but he was kind of hesitating in some of the possessions to attack one-on-one, -on -one, to try to, he was just looking where to kick the ball. And then after that, both him and Jordan Lloyd stepped up, hit those big shots, uh, Kobo with some step backs, with some passes. I thought Monaco did a much better job yesterday of cutting back doors yeah. after, you know, when Maccabi stunted, uh, got some easy layups, got some alley-oop dunks or, or easy just points uh, under the rim. Mm. And basically, I thought Monaco will need to make at least 10 free pointers to win that game and make less than 10 turnovers. So they had 10 turnovers, but they managed to hit only seven frees and win. But you could count those Fouls, fouls like has some free points. Free point value. Exactly. It's free point value. Uh, honestly, these days you would expect a team that shoots 14 from 29 from to free win. point uh, range to win when their opponents are shooting 7 from 24. But you have Monaco with 15 offensive rebounds, then you have Maccabi with 6, you have Maccabi with 15 turnovers, you have Monaco ten. with 10. I don't have the stats, points from turnovers, but I'm pretty sure that Monaco leads uh, in that. Um, and yeah, I mean, amazing thing to me, uh, that I'm thinking, I'm running the game in my head once Back. again. T to me, the amazing points thing- Points of turnovers, 21 to seven. Whew, man, that's 14 point difference. 14 point plus 20 to 10 second chance points. I'm just, I'm, I'm just still thinking about the quality of basketball we wit we witnessed in the first half. Mike James on one side, with Baldwin on the other side. And what amazes me is that Monaco got their first rebound in the game with eight <laughs> minutes played because that was the first shot that Maccabi, Maccabi missed. missed when Darren Hillard uh, shot the floater with his weaker right hand. That was mm. their first miss. Mm. They made their first eight shots and they were up by one. Because on the other side, Mike James was cooking. <laughs> like, I said, Man, that's, I, that's said just crazy. I said uh, after the first uh, first quarter, this is the greatest start to a do or die elimination game I've yeah. ever seen. Usually, the start is kind of uh, clumsy, R rusty, clumsy. Team, teams are still a bit nervous. You know, there's some fouls, turnovers, you shots. Expe you expect yeah. a low scoring game in a in a do or die elimination, yeah. like in the NBA. If you're watching Game Seven, you're probably expecting a lower scoring than the team's average. Yeah. Dogfight, as they say. Dogfight. And I remember watching these, you know, mm, finals between Lakers and Celtics game seven. It finished like 85 to 79, something like that. The, sc the scores. Yeah. Or Spurs Pistons 2005. <laughs> Nobody could score. And yesterday we got a 60, um, almost a 60 point first quarter. I think 59. Uh, the first uh, quarter finished 33, 26, 26 to, to Maccabi. So 59. The first half in Konas, Barcelona Rangers finished <laughs> 29, 26. The first half. The first half. Not the first quarter. So 59 points in this first quarter. And then you have Real Madrid scoring 59 yeah. in the second half in the other in the other game five. And Maccabi has a seven point lead after first quarter. Monaco starts 15-0 in the second quarter. The biggest run of the playoffs, Olympiacos also had a 15-0 uh, run. Yeah, in the second quarter of game, of game five. Of game five, yeah, and Monaco had the same. Uh, I just want to give a huge shout out to all these role players stepping up. I want to I wanna talk about both captains, John Di Bartolomeo on, on one side and Jakuba Utara on the other side. I mean, 
these energy effort players uh they're defending they're up to the task if you need them they will be on the court they will do all the right things i mean utara with his energy he's ve- he's a very good player to start the game to give that spark to make the opponent feel uncomfortable and if he gets some spot up shots it's even better That's even better but he's also a good cutter to the basket in my opinion his backdoor cuts are kind of underrated uh so these guys also chima moneke john brown in the series as well donatas motiunas he was the best post-up player or i, I should say the only the post-up only player, player in the series and he was he was making a difference in in, in certain situations uh so yeah so many uh, role players stepping up for both teams and uh I just want to say that Maccabi had a great season. They lost in 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 a in a battle in a game 5, but they had a great season. Uh we should talk about it uh how they made it to the playoffs. People didn't really believe that that is going to be their year and we had doubts about Baldwin and Brown playing together and Kataj being the head coach and all of that, but they went through a lot. They had a great season. I mean, uh, I said before the the playoffs. These are two of m- these are two my two favorite teams in the league. Yeah. Monaco is my number <laughs> one, and Maccabi is my number two. So I would be happy w- either way. But uh, now I'm happy for Monaco, Rocket team. I I believed in them all the time, <laughs> and I'm I just love to see them in the final four. But Maccabi, they should get a lot of respect for for this season. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I think. Uh... We should go to the last, last the but earliest, not least. Yeah, it was, it, was on Tuesday, it was played on Tuesday. Uh, Fenerbahce Olympiakos, game five. It's Lucas time once again. Uh, these, these, I can't say old legends, but. No, let's but, not say old. Let's just say. Just veteran leadership. Legendary or players. Legendary players already still deciding games. And could we say Costas Lucas is the clutchest player, I think, after this playoff series and after his performances? Uh I this mean season. <laughs> I mean I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, like what else can you say? If 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 it wasn't for his game winner in Istanbul, who knows? I mean, it, it wasn't for his game winner, I really believe Fenerbahce we are talking about Fenerbahce in the final four right now. And that would be a huge upset. The that would be seed. probably one of the biggest upsets recently. And the eighth seed beating the, the first seed. Uh, it was, to me, it was um, interesting to watch these two different coaches, these two different philo- philosophies clash. I think uh, what Dimitris Itudis did in this series deserve a lot of, a lot of credit. He basically approach the series by trying to limit Olympiakos' greatness, by trying to expose their weaknesses, while Yorgos Borsokas did the exact opposite. He wasn't really reacting to what Fenerbahce offered. He stayed true, true to his lineups. Yeah. He fixed them a little bit in Game 5. You know, Thomas Walker played only 15 minutes uh, after having this, you know, subpar series, especially shooting the ball. But what, what he did is, did is basically he put Fenerbahce in the best spot to succeed, but Olympiakos greatness was just too, too big to overcome in my eyes. Some things I enjoyed, you know, was how they tried to limit uh, walk up Papa Nicolau and others just by going under every time on the screen. So you don't involve help. So you are not helping from Sasha Vizenkov. He yeah. is getting less shots. And uh, game four was a good illustration of that. Walkup shot nine times, Sasha Vizenkov, I think five or six only in the same amount of minutes played. And it's definitely not something you want if you are uh, an Olympiakos fan. Uh, Kostas Lukas was probably the center of this series. Uh, since Itudis knew what Olympiakos are going to do with Nick Kalatis on the court, you know, help off of him, yeah. stunt every time. Uh, he said, whoever is guarded by Slukas, we are going to attack him one-on-one. We saw Carson Edwards, uh, shout out to him after not playing much in the end of regular season. He stayed ready. Uh, he got some great games in, in games uh, in games where he played uh, more minutes. He sees Slukas in front of him. 
you see Tudis on the sidelines just saying, you know, spread out, spread out, attack him. And he scored uh, more than more than a few times. Tyler Dorsey, you know, guarded by Thomas Walkup. Thomas Walkup, a great defender, but he is really aggressive. He's overplaying you. So Fenerbahce does, don't bring a pick and roll because you bring help. You just spread out, make gaps to drive for yeah. him, put four players on the baseline so he has all the mid-range, all the three-point area. And Dorsey, I don't know in this series, but how many times we saw him score on, on Thomas Walkup. And it's like, damn, Dorsey scoring so easily against the best perimeter defender in the, in the Defensive EuroLeague. player of the year, probably. Defensive pr player of the year, probably. So just these moves from from Mitudis and and then uh if 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 Slukas guarded Dyson Pierre you go to the post immediately you don't even play the sets you play the matchups and yeah. to me it was uh really close to you know what NBA teams do they 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 pick one or two players in the series and they constantly go at at them uh but in the end Slukas was the one he was the Ooh, decider. He was the decider. He still showed that his offense and and his greatness in 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 attack is still better than you know any problems he might have on the on the defensive side. Look, I must say that fifty three points scored by left handed players should be a playoff record. <laughs> Olympiakos had fifty three <laughs> points scored by left handed players because Papa Nicola also showed up and Vazenko finished yeah. with seventeen, but. Speaking about Game 5, not the whole series. I mean, in, in the whole series, yeah. we had three very close games. Game 2, Game 3, Game 4. Uh, but speaking about Game 5, do you think that Olympiakos was always in the driver's seat, similar to last year when they played Game 5 versus Monaco? Or was Fenerbahce in the game? I think in the second quarter, when they went on this 15-0 to zero run, yeah. uh, with Slukas basically making all the plays scoring, plus uh, Shaq McKissing getting some points in transition and making one open free. I think from that moment on, Fenerbahce did not really have the chance after that. They were always, you know, around the 10 point margin at least. And uh, Olympiakos did not really let them back into the game. That's why I think that game five was the most boring one, if you could say boring. I mean, game, the least, game, game one was not that entertaining. No, I'm, I'm uh, comparing out of all game the fives. three game fives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The least entertaining I, one. It, I, it wasn't I agree boring. With that. It wasn't boring, but it was the least entertaining I because agree. the other two were just so spectacular. I yesterday. agree. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Marco Guderich, 8 from 12, shooting freeze. The rest of the crew. Guess who he was guarded at the start of when he entered the court? Thomas Walker. Costas Lucas. Oh, Costas Lucas. <laughs> After game yeah. four, I was like, why Costas Lucas is guarding Dyson Pierre initially? You just pass him the, the ball to him into the post and you need double teams, you know, and you can you can pass mm -hmm. out the ball. Why he's not guarding Guderich? He starts guarding Guderich and Itudis puts him in as many pick and, pick and rolls as possible. But still, eight from 12, the rest of the crew, zero, zero from 15. From all. Any thoughts on that? Uh, just a bad night or, or or what happened because they do have good shooters we've seen it obviously Fenerbahce when they um, won at home and also they, they were very close in game three it was not because of their offense it was a low scoring game it was uh, they did not basically Olympiacos because play. of their defense but mm -hmm. Olympiacos also had struggle shooting free oh, four from 19 but so many missed shots by trustworthy players like um, Hayes Davis, Dyshawn Pierre. Tyler Dorsey, uh, zero from five. Tyler Dorsey, Carson Edwards. Do you think that was a big issue as well? I mean, definitely. Definitely no, no other player hitting a three is, is a big issue to your offense. Uh, you expect Tyler Dorsey to, to make yeah. at least some shots. You expect Hayes Davis. You expect Dyson Pierre to hit those shots. I mean, he's, if I'm not mistaken, he has a 50% uh, three-point percentage. He uh, went scoreless in 34 minutes. Wow. He and Hayes Davis did not make a single... Uh, wow. Wait. I have to not make mistake here. Uh... Nigel Hayes Davis zero four from the, for four from the field in thirty eight minutes and yeah. Dyson Pierre zero from two and Dyson Pierre was the guy who killed Olympiakos in game four when they were sending help 
yeah. from, from the strong side. I mean, these two guys, they were basically the uh, carrying Fenerbahce in those first yeah. four games. Oh. These two, Dyson Pierre and Nigel Hayes, they, they went the, the difference makers. Without a field goal. And without a field goal in game five. Wow. Anyway, um, why I want to give a lot of credit to Fenerbahce and to this. This is a new team. They build a new team with so many new signings, with a new head coach. And during the season, there were ups and downs. They barely made it to the playoffs. They were the eighth seed. Olympiacos on the other side, the most consistent team. These players have been together for quite a number a of years, for quite a while. The core, I'm talking. About. They added the role players, but but the core of the team was together for two, three, four, or even five years, so some of those guys. So obviously they have great chemistry. They know each other so well. Uh, they trust each other. And Fenerbahce is a newly built team. And for them to be this close to making it to the final four, it's already an achievement in, in, in my eyes. Yes, these are big name players. We're not talking about some low budget team being here and competing. Obviously, Fenerbahce is one of the powerhouses. But it's not easy when you select a group of guys to make it happen in, in your first year. And that's what Itudis did. And that was hell of a series. So for that, I think they deserve a lot of credit. I agree, uh, definitely. Uh, I mean, it, it it seems like we are giving uh, credits to all the team that, uh, every team that has lost in these playoffs, but that's the true. I mean, three game fives, uh, both Maccabi, Fenerbahce and Partizan, both, you know, if, if those three teams won, we wouldn't be here surprised yeah because they did something special during this series and you know as i said you know put their teams to be in the best spot to win and they were so close from doing that i mean if costas lucas doesn't hit that shot in game three who knows there if, are a lot of what ifs there are what if what that ifs. fight didn't happen in madrid yeah, what if costas exactly. lucas didn't make that shot by the way do you think it was a travel right I mean, yes, but I don't expect it to be called in the NBA or in the EuroLeague. I can't imagine the refs seeing exactly. that and calling that. I'm sorry. They, you see that it's a travel when you're watching it in slow motion after the fourth replay. So, I mean... My take on this, it is technically a travel. Yeah. But if the refs would call such a travel on every time it happens we wouldn't be watching basketball, none of you, because it would be unwatchable, true, because it true. would be called in every second possession in my Fast eyes. Fast breaks. In, uh, Fast breaks every time. Look, look, at, look, at, look at the player's legs when they catch the ball running off staggers, for example, yeah. and they turn their whole body. They make three or four steps. And this is an uh, unwritten rule, I think, of, of basketball, you know, it does not really give Lucas any advantage there. What kind of advantage can you get when you're shooting a Hail Mary shot? <laughs> Hayes Davis, if, if he was 0 0.005 seconds, you know, closer to Lucas, yeah. that, that would have been a block. So... Uh, these wounds will heal. I think Fenerbahce will be a very serious team next season. Uh, it's a good experience for them. Obviously, they might make some roster adjustments, but it just shows that they are on the right track with the right coach, and that's that's important. And Olympiacos is obviously going for the title. Uh, my thought um, w yesterday was that um, now all of a sudden the Airbnb prices and the hotel prices <laughs> and Konas are going to go down. Go down. <laughs> There's no partisan, there's no Maccabi, there's no... A lot of tickets uh, suddenly. <laughs> Fenerbahce, yeah. These three clubs with huge fan bases and yeah. Monaco, Barcelona, Real Madrid, they are not really known for traveling fans or, or very loud support in general. Although I want to give a shout out to Rocket Team because when it was game five, these people showed up. They created a nice atmosphere. It's not like the usual European support, mm -hmm. but it was loud. You could hear them chanting players' names. The The announcer was very passionate and energetic with all these defense, defense. <laughs> and it was really nice to see. And you felt that it's kind of a home court advantage because the Maccabi fans were somewhere there in, in a balcony and you could not hear them as loud as you did in game one or game two. So 
yeah, shout out to them. They showed up for their team, showed some support, showed some love. But we will not see these uh, crazy fans in Konas. Olympiakos fans will be dominating, obviously. Final Four definitely uh, will miss out on Maccabi fans, on Hardison fans. Uh, definitely from, from that point of uh, view, the Final Four got a little bit worse. And I don't know, I, after this, watching this fantastic series, I'm, I'm really sad. To me, the season... I don't know, ended yesterday in some... Exactly, in some, my in point exactly. Point we brag about EuroLeague playoffs, how special they are, but the Final Four just kills that vibe. But it, it, it arrives and, and finishes in two weeks. Exactly. And I'm following just, both, EuroLeague and NBA. I, I barely missed any games recently. And the thing is that in the NBA, we're just midway through. It's not even... It's not even it's midway. Not, it's not <laughs> it's even conference midway. finals yet. <laughs> Yeah. And we might get some game sevens right now. And in EuroLeague, it's done. We had two weeks of pure basketball entertainment. And now we're looking forward to a Final Four event where we will see two semifinals decided by one game. We will see a meaningless game for the third. And we will see the final as, as sort of a cup competition. And, and these teams were fighting for 34 games in the regular season. They were battling in the, in the series best of five. I think it's unfair, but we've talked about it a lot how it, it it would be really difficult to make a schedule right now with the semi-final series True. and final series and also barcelona faces madrid right right now imagine if it's best of five they will probably face each other in the in acb the league ACB as league. well playing a best of five it kind of doesn't make sense right they could end up uh playing uh 14 games uh head to head you know if they play in the finals if they play in the semi-final series in the euroleague you have plus uh, two more games in the regular season and two more regular season games in the ACB. Yeah. <laughs> That's that, 14 that, regular that season does, matchups. That doesn't really sound right. <laughs> anyway. But anyway, uh, uh, we started with predictions. Uh, yeah. I know we are going to have uh, predictions next week. We're going to have a podcast uh, previewing the final four yeah. next week. Hopefully the main host will be here with us. <laughs> Where is he right now? I think he is uh, not able to participate because he celebrated with Bonaco yesterday. Or is, no, he, on a, or is he on a plane? No, I think he's on a plane. I hope he's on a plane. Moment. I hope he's on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't text me yesterday, today. So <laughs> who knows where Donatus is? Um, yeah, I think we're done here. Yeah, we're going to do predictions some Next other week. time. I think that's it. Please give us some feedback. Was it good without a host? <laughs> Did you like it or not? Did you like the playoffs? Uh, don't forget to like. And don't forget to say everything you have in yourselves about the refs because they are the evil part of the EuroLeague that destroy the playoffs and kill your teams. So thank you guys <laughs> for watching and see you next time. <laughs>